So I'll start again. So hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar in our COVID series, where we're joined today by two new speakers, Dr. Miloslav Sander and Dr. Rod Chalk, both of whom are going to be sharing insights into the glycosylation on the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. I have a few of the usual housekeeping points to go over before handing over to the first of today's speakers. So as always, we're using the Slack channel for questions and discussions, so please join us there to ask your questions, share any thoughts and discuss the work. It also really helps us to prioritise questions that others want to hear the answers to, so please use the thumbs up to let us know those questions you'd like to hear answered. And Slack will also allow our speakers to answer any other questions or follow up afterwards when the talks are finished. And for those needing an attendance certificate for this webinar, the details will be available on how to get this after the last slide. So once again, we'd like to say a big thank you to the European Proteomics Association, the British Society for Proteome Research, the Young Proteomics Investigators Club, and the London Proteomics Discussion Group Committee for their help and support in setting up this webinar. Thanks also to the London Biological Mass Spectrometry Discussion Group, the London Metabolomics Network, and the News in Proteomics Research blog for promoting this event. We're also really grateful for Imperial College London for providing us with the webinar support. And thanks also to our YouTube channel subscribers and just to remind everyone that all talks today will be available to watch again online afterwards. And a huge thank you, of course, to our speakers for today. So we're pleased to announce also that our next non-COVID webinar will be on Friday the 4th of September at two o'clock in the afternoon, British Summertime, where we will have guest chair Leonard Martins hosting the session on proteomics, the role of proteogenomics, with our speaker, Professor Jana Lettio uh, from the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, who will be presenting on the connection of cancer genotype with molecular phenotype. So now I'll hand over uh, to the first of today's speakers, Dr. Rod Chalk from the Structural Genomics Consortium in Oxford. So Rod gained his PhD in 1992 at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, working on the innate immune peptides from mosquitoes. And he began using mass spectrometry for bioactive peptide natural product drug discovery at the Queen's University of Belfast in 1996, subsequently working on the SMP genotyping and cryodetector mass spectrometry. More recently, Rod has worked in proteomics and biopharmaceuticals using a variety of techniques and instruments. Rod joined the Structural Genomics Consortium in Oxford in 2008, and his current interests include high throughput protein characterization, membrane proteins, quantitative mass spectrometry, and the application of native mass spectrometry to structural biology and uh, drug discovery. Today, he's going to talk to us about the identification, mapping, and relative quantification of SARS-CoV-2 spike glycopeptides by mass retention time fingerprinting. So it's over to you, Rod. Thank you very much, Joanna. I'm going to request control. OK, so as Joanna said, today I'm going to be talking about uh, a technique uh, which we've named uh, mass retention time fingerprinting for characterization of the SARS uh, spike protein. So I will say one or two things about problems involved in analyzing spike. I'm going to describe the glycopeptide discovery workflow uh, that we've used. Uh, we'll have a look at the glycopeptide database that we've constructed and then we'll talk about how we can use that for a very simple method very simple workflow for uh, a spike characterization. So I guess spike probably doesn't need any um, introduction. Um, it's a, I'll give you an introduction anyway, it's, it's a um, it, it's a very large protein, it's a, 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 it's a trimer. The trimer is roughly 100 and, uh, 450 kilodaltons. Um, and this is the structure, if you're a structural biologist, but of course, as we all know, that actually isn't the structure, this is the structure of spike. And one of the problems with spike, it is, is massively glycosylated. One of the most heavily glycosylated proteins I've had uh, the fortune or misfortune to work on. And if you're a structural biologist, you might choose to try and ignore that glycosylation, but of course you can't. In the case of spike, uh, it, it's very probable that that glycosylation is involved in immune evasion, so it's part of, of, of the virus's pathogenicity. And the degree and type of that of glycosylation is going to be determined by the host cell expression system that's used uh, to express it, but also on the growth conditions. And because of that, uh, we have seen substantial variation in spike glycosylation from batch to batch. And just to illustrate that, 
these are um, five different. Uh, this is not spike. This is this is the receptor binding domain. So this is a a, 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 a small portion of spike. It has only two glycosylation sites. Um, but even so, you can see there is considerable um, uh, variation in the in the glycosylation envelope from one purification to the next. So as I said, the receptor binding uh, domain, it only has two glycosylation sites. Um, if we assume a very simple case where there are only six major glycans, uh, the number of possible glycoforms would be uh, six squared, which would be um, 36, which is a reasonably manageable number, and you can just about analyze that by intact mass as we've done here. But you can see immediately there is a problem in that because there are uh, two glycosylation sites, there are two possible structures from the observed mass. So we're not getting positional information. Um, on the full length spike protein, um, things are a lot more complicated because again, if we assume there are only six major glycans, there are 22 N-linked glycosylation sites. As we'll find out later, there, there are several more O-linked glycosylation sites. But if you calculate the number of possible glycoforms, it's a ridiculously large number. And if you try to analyze that by intact mass, the signal will completely disappear. So I can't show you, uh, I can't show you a spectrum, but if you were trying to do it, it would probably look something like this. So intact mass analysis is probably not possible. Uh, even if it were, it's not giving you positional information. Of course, you can do released glycan analysis. Um, we've done some work on this, but again, this will not give you positional information. So what that means is you're going to have to do glycopeptide analysis. You're going to have to do MSMS. But there are some problems associated with that as well. You're going to have to have one glycosylation site per peptide. And if all you use is trypsin, this is not going to not going to do the job because there are no tryptic sites between uh, these two glycosylation sites on spike. Um, you'll know the peptide mass, but you won't know the glycan mass. So your glycopeptide masses are effectively unknown. So you're not going to be able to do a precursor database match. You're going to have to do MSMS fragmentation. That's got problems associated with it if the fragmentation energy is too soft. Um, we're going to fragment the glycan, but not the peptide. Conversely, if the energy is too hard, we're going to fragment the, pep fragment the peptide, but we're going to lose the glycosylation. Um, we're going to lose the glycan. And also, if for any reason your glycopeptide is not selected for MSMS or if it doesn't fragment, of course, you're not going to get any hit. So we realize this is actually quite a major analytical problem. But we have one thing going in our favor in is we have a very long standing relationship with Agilent. And when they discovered that we were working on spike protein, they got in touch and they said, uh, what can we do to help? So we ended up uh, working very closely with Agilent. And um, the first thing we had to decide on is which enzyme do we want to use for our digestion? And we chose elastase. Um, it's probably not the first choice in, in most proteomic studies. Um, but we wanted to have a single enzyme. There are a number of advantages to elastase. You can see if you're not familiar with it, elastase uh, cleaves at the C terminal for these residues. Um, also, it cleaves non-specifically. Um, we've seen that in, in, in the digest we've done. That does not actually cause a problem in the analysis. And um, because it cuts more frequently than trypsin, it generates shorter peptides. And there are several advantages to having shorter peptides. One of these is going to give us a higher TIC signal. Another advantage is because we need to separate those peptides, shorter peptides are going to be more readily se separated by reverse phase HPLC. And also we need to do de novo sequencing. And again, that's easier if the peptide is shorter. But the principal advantage is this, that using elastase, there is a single uh, glycosylation site per peptide, and that's essential for unambiguous glycan mapping. The next decision we had to make was how are we going to separate these glycopeptides? So if you want to separate a glycan, glycans are uh, predominantly polar and they will separate very well by hillock. Um, 
they will not really readily separate by reverse phase. Conversely, uh, peptides, they're going to separate their comparatively non-polar, they will separate well on reverse phase, less well by hyliac. So when we have a glycopeptide, if we choose to separate that glycopeptide by reverse phase, what we will observe, and I'll give an example here, we can separate the peptides very well by, um, by reverse phase, but the glycans are not resolved. So what you can see here, if I look at these peptides here, you can see we've got good resolution, baseline to baseline resolution here for peptides. Where these overlap, these are um, different glycans on the same peptide. Um, so conventionally, this is thought of a, 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 as a problem. Um, but there is a very talented scientist at uh, an adjunct called Will Greenland, and he came up with what I think is a rather clever idea. He said, well, why don't we take a reverse phase column? Um, this is the one we use, the advanced bio column. We use it to separate the peptides, and we know that the peptides bearing different glycans are going to co-elute. So what we can do is we can use that fact that the, they will have a common retention time in order to map these different glycans onto the spike sequence. So I rather like that. This is a nice example of the problem actually becoming the solution. So this is the workflow we came up with. Um, we begin by uh, digesting with elastase. That will generate a variety of peptides and glycopeptides. As you can see, each glycopeptide has the possibility of several different glycans on the same sequence. We're then going to um, separate that by reverse phase, and there are two things happening in this um, chromatogram. The first thing that's happening is we have a separation of peptides and glycopeptides by virtue of unique retention types. But the second thing is happening, and you can see it Right. You can see it here in these three examples is we've got coalition. So we have glycans series on the same peptide um, coalluting, which means that we can identify that glycan, um, uh, that, that the, the, the peptide that that glycan belongs to by virtue of a common retention time. And I can illustrate that uh, rather nicely with um, this, this peptide is, uh, um, this glycopeptide comes from position uh, N343, and there are 27 glycoforms of this peptide, and every single one of them will elute within this relatively narrow retention time window that's about four minutes wide. So, we then need from our, our uh, MS data, we need to identify which, are, which species are actually glycopeptides. And we can do that by um, looking at the MSMS, looking for these oxonium reporter ions. These are indicative of a glycan. And also looking for this sugar uh, hexose ladder, which is also indicative of a glycan. So we can identify which uh, compounds in our uh, experiments are glycopeptides. And, and we can we can uh, um, derive what that what that glycan is. We've done it here. We've got a full um, sequence for a uh, mannose five uh, on on this peptide. Um, and we have the full um, the full full ladder and uh, we're identifying all of these sugars by virtue of their accurate mass. Um, but how do we know that this is the peptide? If that's the mass, um, how do we know that this is this is the peptide? Well, to be sure of that, we need to do some MSMS. And the way that we've done that is by pseudo MS3. So how that works is basically we need to um, strip away the glycan and we can do that in the source by in-source decay at a high fragmentation voltage and then we can we can uh, isolate the peptide stub and then 
uh, perform an MSMS experiment on that and determine the sequence by uh, de novo sequencing, as we've done here. And then finally, we take all of this data set and we collate it into a database. And that database is going to hold the accurate mass for each species, the retention time for each species, and also the glycopeptide structure where we've been able to determine it. So this is what the database looks like. A um, couple of things to point out about this. The first thing is you can see that these are um, uh, different glycans on the same peptide and they all elute very, very close to each other. And that holds for all the different species, all the um, uh, um, all the glycans will co-elute um, from the same peptide. Um, the other thing to notice here is um, some of these peptides, some of these glycopeptides we've we've observed. So, for, for example, here, um, man six, man five, man four. Um, but there's something else we can do. We so so mammalian glycan processing is is very well understood and we know the sequence of how these sugars are are made so that we can deduce that if this particular structure we haven't observed this structure the gene ought is not observed however we can accurately predict the mass and we can also predict the retention time so um so what we have with this database is we have observed 140 uh, spike glycopeptides. We have uh, um, observed retention time and observed accurate masses for these peptides and the structure. Um, they are um, they represent 13 of spikes, 22 glycosylation sites. Uh, we also have a further six which we have yet to assign. Um, but also we are able to infer the mass and the retention time of the FERSA 306 spike glycopeptides. So that's the workflow. Um, it's complicated. It's complicated. It's also very time consuming. It takes several weeks to, um, to, to manually uh, assess the data and generate, generate this um, this database. However, that's not the issue. The important thing is the database, because once you have this database, we then can have a much simpler workflow. And this we call this a mass retention time fingerprinting workflow. And it's very simple indeed. Basically, all we need to do is overnight digestion with elastase. We perform a LCMS experiment, we don't need MSMS because we're only measuring the accurate mass and retention time. And then all we need to do is interrogate the database that we already have. Um, with that, we can identify the, uh, the glycopeptide, its glycan structure, and from the iron intensity, we can deduce the relative abundance. So essentially, that's it. The essentials of the method is it's actually very, very simple. All we have to do is an overnight elastase digestion. We need a 60 minute reverse phase LCMS run. Um, all you have to do is basically duplicate the reverse phase conditions that we've used. Um, you can pick those up from this. This is on BioArchive if you want to, want to use a method. Um, the advantage of this method, I would say, is you can use this on any HPLC system. You can use it on any accurate mass uh, electrospray instruments or any TOF or an Orbitrap. You need to have the mass retention time database, but that's available. You can download that here. And I think the big advantage for a lot of mass spectrometers is you don't need to be an expert in uh, glycobiology. I would definitely say I am not an expert in glycobiology, but you can get an awful lot of information from this method. Um, and the reason we've done it is basically so this could be used for quality control. So um, we can QC spike glycopeptides within less than 90 minutes. Um, that's all I want to say, uh, except I'd like to uh, acknowledge the people who've, who've helped very much with this work. Uh, Tiago for helping with the mass spec, Jesse, Ellie, Shibash, Tina, Rama, Ale, 
and Nicola. These are the people who um, cloned Spike, expressed it, purified the protein. Without their uh, help, we would we would not have anything to work on. A big vote of thanks to Agilent. I would certainly say without their help, we would not have been able to do this. In particular, Will Greenland, he's one of the best mass spectrometers I've worked with. Also like to um, acknowledge David Harvey. I'd like to thank you for listening. Uh, great talk, Rod. So there's been a few uh, questions coming on the Slack channel, which I will um, read out to you now, and then hopefully we can we've got a bit of time for discussion uh, before we have our second speaker. Um, so um, Harry's actually asked, um, what was the variation in the chromatography that you put up? Was that all from the same cell lines when you were talking at the beginning about the batch to batch variation in the gly? This was all on the same cell line. Yes. Right. Um, and then. Um, I had a question actually. Um, how, how reproducible do you find the elastase cleavage? I mean, are even the non specific sites reproducibly obtained with every digest? Um, I would say the reproduction is, is reasonably reliable. Um, I mean, I would say this is, this is generally true of most of the enzymes we use, is we see, that we see the same peptides every time we do it, more or less. Obviously, it's not, a, it's not totally reproducible, but it, it's, it's reasonably so. Um, and then also, um, how much starting material do you actually require for, for um, the? This is with 65 micrograms of material. And um, given that you've got the batch to batch reproducibility in generating um, the spike protein, um, are you able to sort of map that uh, variability with your method? Yes, this is some. Think, yes, we will be able to do this. This is something that we're still in the process of doing. The, 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 the reason we've done, done it this way is basically we thought the useful thing here is a database. Everyone can use this and we just want to get it out. We have, we have to do a lot of characterization still. So this is a work in progress. And do you think you'd be able to obtain enough material from um, the actual viral protein if you got it from somewhere? Ah, well, that, no, that's, I mean, I mean, the, this the expression system here is HEC uh, 293 and um, this is this is a very important question is what are we what are we actually what are we all looking at are we are we is this biologically relevant um, I can sidestep that and say what what matters for the the use these the, the, the protein is being put to is is reproducibility if you want to know that it doesn't have to be exactly the same as in 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 human ex in in the, the wild type uh, glycosylation, but it does need to be the same from batch to batch. But ultimately, um, yes, if you're going to raise antibodies, or, or I, I guess you do want to have the same glycosylation pattern as in in vivo. Um, I don't think that's an easy experiment to do. No, it doesn't sound like it. <laughs> But yeah, you're right, very interesting. And um, so a couple of other people also have some technical questions. So is the database a uh, retention time index um, so that if people have got slightly different C18 chemistries or LC instruments that you've got an index retention time? Yeah, we haven't we haven't done that. I think my advice would be to 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 try and duplicate the HPLC as closely as possible. So I would suggest using the same column and and the same running conditions um you could do this um it's not something we've we've looked at right and uh, what level of mass accuracy are you using with your uh, retention okay. um so i i did i did put some some data up there but it, it's basically it's all sub 10 ppm i think the majority of them are much much more accurate than that below 5 ppm Great. And uh, one last uh, also technical question. Have you considered using I mobility uh, to separate coeluting peptides? But I, th I think that's a very I think that's a very interesting. That's a very interesting um, uh, 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 question. Um, we don't have I mobility here. Um, Agilent have I mobility in their demo lab. It's something I've suggested. So it's another it's another dimension to the separation. Um, obviously, accurate mass on its own is not good enough. You want to have accurate mass and retention time and ideally uh, eye mobility as well would be an extra dimension. I think that will make it make it a better database. 
Um, I did just just to say the database itself, it's incomplete. And I think, you know, um, that this will become apparent uh, from, from uh, Miller's talk is um, it's never going to it's never we're never going to be able to characterize every possible you're never going to be able to observe every possible glycan from spike. Um, but the more you can add to it, um, the more useful the database becomes. Yeah, great. Um, so that seems to be it for the moment for the questions. I'm sure more come in normally after people have had time to digest your talk. Um, but in the meantime, I will move on to introducing uh, Milo and his talk. Uh, and then, of course, you can also um, take a look at the Slack channel and address any questions that come in in the meantime. Um, so our second speaker today is Dr. Miros Miloslav Sander from Georgetown University Medical Center in Washington, DC. So Miloslav began his career as a specialist in analytical and bioanalytical chemistry with a specialist interest in mass spectrometry at the Czech Agriculture and Food Inspection Authority. After his transition to the Institute of Organic Chemistry and Biochemistry at the Czech Academy of Sciences uh, in Prague, he established and led a proteomic subgroup at the Institute. He has since developed and implemented the latest methodology for qualitative and quantitative proteomics for projects related to cancer biology, virology, enzymology and entomology. In 2010, he began his postdoctoral work at the Georgetown Medical uh, Center, concentrating on bioanalytical MS projects in glycobiology and cancer. His current effort is focused on the structure specific resolution of glycostructures. So today he's going to speak to us about the N and O linked uh, glycosylation of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. So it's over to you, Miloslav. And unlike me, don't forget to unmute yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I just did. Thank you. Uh, so I I will start. Uh, my my presentation is focused for more for the, the glycan portion actually of the glycopeptide derivative from the triptych or, or Lucy triptych digestion of the SARS-CoV uh, spike glycoprotein. I'll start with the, with the glycopeptide fragmentation and the, actually what is the problem. On the left side, you can see the fragmentation of the of the peptide and pretty nice the, the Y ion sequence and pretty, pretty nice the, the peptide sequence coverage. On the other hand, you can see the fragmentation of the glycopeptide that you can see at a big portion of the glycans, which called coxonium ion, some of the peptide with the with the piece of sugar on it, which uh, called uh, the capital Y ions and really low uh, or sensitive uh, or, or intensive, intensive the, the peptide sequence ions. And another problem is micro heterogeneity, which means that on one side there is a multiple glycans and macro heterogeneity, which basically each glycoside is differently occupied. And as I showed, uh, glycopeptide, they don't fragment effici uh, efficiently and uh, they also ionize worse than in the positive mode, worse than the peptide. And what about the fragmentation? On the left side, you can see the different fragmentation profile if we change the collision energy. And on the low collision energy condition, you have really high intensive capital Y ions, which basically is a fragmentation here, the outer arm structures and on the left side, the oxonium ions, which are related to the again, the outer arm, mostly outer arm structures. So and in the high collision energy, you have basically, as I showed before, that peptide with the with the gluconac and mix of the oxonium ions, which actually is a piece of sh sugar from whole glycan structure. And on the on the right side, you can see the same from IgG glycopeptide. And you can see that major fragmentation and the local collision energy is that loss of one arm, which actually we use for for elucidation of uh, outer arm structures. And then we, we use that high intensive capital Y ions to develop methodology for quantification of the glycopeptides in the complex matrix, even with the with the methodology using data independent analysis or or the PRM, uh, high sensitive PRM uh, analysis uh, using low collision energy and uh, capital Y ions as a 
as a, as a high selective fragments. You can see this is the complex mixture and this capital Y ions fragments from, from those structure of, uh, in this case, the kininogen. And now let's focus on the on the oxonium ions and, and selectivity for that outer arm uh, structure. So the lower collision energy is the higher oxonium ions arm glycostructure specificity is. So we can see here clearly that cellulated arm basically dirt fragments are gone in a higher collision energy than 40. And here that the gray line shows similar ions to here, which is here is a the, the structure they call it Galilee structure, and this ion is uh, is high in the in the across all the collision energy settings, but here is the same ions which which is fragmentation of arm con with the manos can appear with the higher collision energy than, than 20. You can see it here. Here on the low collision energy, you don't have that 520A ion. And here you can see that actually is starting appearing. And on the right side, you can see one actually structure, which, which is the asymmetric glycan. On, on one arm is a Lucknack structure, which is this. On other arm is a Lucknack structure, and it's monocellulated. And you can see in collision energy 35, you don't see any evidence of the cellulate and which arm is cellulated. And on the low collision energy, you can actually see that predominantly is a cellulated of cellulated the, the Lagdinac, Lagdinac structure and the Lagdinac structure, the isomer uh, is, a, is a low, low content concentration. And what about the structure elucidation from, from the fragmentation and the low collision energy? Uh, why it's important to, to actually check the fragmentation spectra? So let's say the common case, there's a G0, is a uh, agalactosylated uh, biantenary glycan. Uh, is it really? Here you can see that actually, in this case, if we check the oxonium ions on the, on the low, and the low collision energy is not agalactosylated by antennae glycans, is a mono, is a single antennae lagdinac containing glycan. And if we compare with the single antennae lagdinac containing glycans, uh, the spectra are actually the same. It's the same glycopeptide, it's the same peptide backbone. And if we check the, the low mass range, we can see here the signature of the of the galnac. So, and what about the by antennae galactosylated. And if you use the ion mobility, in this case is a thin stuff. Uh, and uh, you can see four peaks separated into the four peak, the same glycopeptide with the same summary glycan summary formula. And actually first, second and third peak, they have a similar spectra as a, as a panel B, which is the hybrid glycans containing lagdina. And only the smallest, let's say less than 30%, is uh, by antennae complex glycans. And why I'm talking about this, this is the PDL1 pro, pro glycoprotein produced in hex cells. And we, we did, we did, uh, we analyzed the several glycoproteins which were produced in hex cells. So uh, we, basically published two papers when we when we analyze the pro BDNF, PD1 and PDL1. And the two papers we have in bioarchives. One is on PDL1 glycosylation, then and there is a lack uh, lagdinac structures and uh, as well as a polylacnac structures and one in the the SARS COVID uh, spike glycoprotein. Uh, in terms of the Glycosylation of cells, glycoprotein, there appears actually several papers already. And uh, as Ero said, the glycosylation can vary based on the glycoprotein source and, and overexpression conditions. And um, overall, that 
uh, the protein has a 24, 22 the sequence, and so far the people were able to find the 2O glycosylation sites. So let's start with Lagdinac. Here on the left side, you can see what we did previously, and is a PDL protein and several oxonum, actually the structure specific oxonum ions, which, which describe the, even the difficosylated Lagdinac. And again, the asymmetric glycan on the on the PDL1. And similar stuff is with the with the SARS-CoV glycoprotein. You can see this is asymmetric structure. One arm is a Lagdinac, one arm is a Lagdinac, both of them are cell related. And you can see the cofocosylation. Here is also the small peak, which is related to outer arm focosylation on the side of the Lagdinac. Uh, what about the sulfate containing structure? Uh, recently, the Professor Zaya reanalyzed uh, Professor Crispin's data and he found a uh, lot of sulfate structure. So we were interested in uh, if we can locate that sulfate. And on, on the right side, you can see clearly that sulfate actually is located on the Lagdinac. Lagdinac structure. So this is interesting structure. One is the arm is a is a sulfated Lagdinac and second arm is a fucosylated cellulated Lagdinac. We don't we don't see the, the cellulated Lagdinac or fucosylated Lagdinac or sulfated Lagdinac. Another case is previous data so lot of lot of co-fucosylation but uh, is it right there? Like that? Uh, we can we can see that core focusulated or outer arm focusulated structure actually is gone when the, the nor normalized collision energy is set up to the 40. So uh, if if you have mixture of outer arm and core focusulated structure, you basically under high collision energy you will see only the core focusulated structures. So here you, you, you can see clearly here under low collision energy, pure core focosylated peptide and pure outer arm uh, focosylated peptide and production of the capital ions. Here is a single ion, here is a doublet of the ions and uh, related the focosylated fragments. And it's similar stuff is with the, with the, with the spike the glycoprotein, for example, this defocosylated lagdinac monosylated structure and specific outer arm focosylated and core focosylated structures. And uh, what about the polylacnac is, is an extended arm structure and we in, in case of PDL glycoproteins we basically analyze this structure efficiently under low collision energy. Either high, under high collision energy you don't see those fragments or under medium collision energy, you basically can get large fragment by fragmentation of the manual score with the with the outer arm structures. So under low collision energy, we can get the signature of the polylacnac structure like this. When we when we did the same with the with the same glycopeptide, just a different expression system, and we could see actually those uh, specific the polylacnac uh, oxygen ions were missing in the in the fragmentation spectra under again under low collision energy. So and this is the case of the COVID SARS glycoprotein. You can see uh, this is glycoside and uh, 1098, and here are two structures with the uh, with the polylacnac signature. So this is a summary of our N glycosylation. We were able to to see our uh, 18 out of the 25 uh, glycosides. One side we really see is unoccupied, and all glycosides basically contain some portion of the of the lagdinac. Two glycosides were predominantly lagdinac, and uh, uh, almost all glycosides were outer arm and as well as a core fucosylate. And some of the uh, some of the glycosides that it contains the polyacnac structure. And let's move to the to the O glycosylation analysis. As I said before, um, 
we saw the data and they 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 could analyze one glycoside located located here uh, that is an interesting uh, polyp basic cleavage site uh, in the human SARS uh, COVID uh, spice glycoprotein and which actually is missing in the other spike proteins yeah from from uh, SARS CoV-1 or from the uh, the animal and that could be actually related to infectivity and near to the human cleavage sites are, are predicted three uh, O-glycosides and we were interested in if we can see the the O-glycosides near to the cleavage sites which could be could actually have an uh, impact to the furin cleavage and the uh, infectivity. And we, we could see actually some portion uh, glycosylated by uh, no, occupied by oglycosylation. And here is a spectrum. We use a higher collision energy uh, for, for analysis of oglycosides and we analyze the deglycos glycosylated protein by PNGSF. And we could see the Dicylo core one structure as well as a core two structure, monosilo, dicylo, or acylo. And we were interested in the analysis of where is the exact location, which side is occupied out of the three predicted. And we could clearly see that only one is occupied and is a, is a glycoside 678. And we performed the uh, ETHCD analysis, and we could see the shifts with the, with the even with the glyco glycan attached on it as a, as a Z Z6 ion that's right here or right here in the shoulder. And when we when we are uh, perform the 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 exoglycosis cleavage, and we we basically got the residue only with the with the uh, Galnac attached on the peptide, we could even see it in the HCD, HCD spectra. And here is actually the, several years ago, we study a structure dependent chromatographic behavior of glycopeptides using cradle phase chromatography. And here actually the, this pattern for exact what we observe for the end glycopeptides before unoccupied and neutral glycans shift the retention time to the shoulder retention time and sialic acid shifts the retention time to the, to the longer. And this is another uh, identified glycopeptide, just different glycosides. This is this is interesting case, as I said, uh, we, we use the deglycosylated peptide for O glycosylation analysis. So this glyco glycopeptide, because uh, the asparagine is converted to the aspartate, means that this was originally occupied by N glycans, and in, in the within the two amino acids there was uh, the O and O glycan. So two big glycans next to each other. And then, as I said, within two, three amino acids, it's, it's, it's unique. And this is a summary of our O glycosylation analysis. This is at site 678 and the other sites. This was the previously reported. This has a site occupancy. We determine site occupancy of, of the previously reported sites as a roughly 40% of uh, that the uh, 678 is uh, roughly 13% the occupancy and here you can see the the, the portion of and, and the contribution of each each glycoform identified and then we try to analyze again some structure structure motifs or of that glycan and for for this analysis because the peptide is long and and sugar is a small uh, we use actually the cyclic ion mobility for it what has helped me with the analysis and strategy we use 
is a uh, iron mobility of, of uh, fragment ions. So in this case, oxonium ions. So we cleave the glycans of the peptides by, by uh, CID in the trap and analyze only oxonium ions by iron mobility. Um, when, we, when we fragment the glycopeptides, uh, for example, for the core two monocellulated core two structure, we could see clearly also signature of the extended core one structure, which is this peak and the, this peak. So it's again it's a mixture of the of the several glycophore, not just a core two, but also core one, extended core one. But when we before previously we analyzed the common uh, the the human glycoprotein just the just the cell of the antigen and we basically got uh, eight eight peaks uh, so by our mobility of course uh, the, the major one is related to the to the uh, the cell related T antigen but what the others are is hard to uh, say at this moment. So, and when we analyze the product ion 657 from all glycopeptides of the SARS CoV the glycoprotein, we could clearly see, and that is a cross collision section 238.9, fits perfectly with previously observed data of the CL T uh, antigen. And when we analyze the core 2 structure or extended core 1, uh, we got two peaks. One is again is a cellulated with the alpha two three linkage cellulated the, the antigen, and second is a cellulated lacnac, which is this portion, and uh, again by alpha two three linkage. The peak, uh, this peak is not symmetric, so we were interested in what is, what else we could we could find actually there. Then this is the single pass. You cannot see clearly. You could you could see just just two peaks. If we use the five passes the higher resolution uh, and we change the collision energy, we could see that actually on the high collision energy, one more peak appears here. And it's known that the acyclic acid of different linkage has a different stability. So when we align the peak and we determine exact cross collision section, we find out that that is a alpha 26 linkage of the LACNAC structure attached on. And this is just the ion mobilograms of the of the different structure from delivered from the from the fragmentation of uh, that old glycopeptide. And you can see here as a as a one major peak. Here we have from from doubly cellulated uh, T antigen we have basically three peaks. We don't know with what is what is this peak. We 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 know here there's a is that Alpha 2 6 linkage, and this is alpha 2 3 linkage. As I saw, uh, we could see alpha 2 6 linkage, alpha 2 3 linkage of the LACNAC, and alpha 2 3 linkage of the of the cell T antigen. And when we when we analyze the doubly cell related, uh, we actually saw that a this ratio is different, which means that here, what is predominantly cellulated is that arm with the with the LACNAC. So about a two third of the isomer contains the cellulated LACNAC in monocellulated structure, and one third contains the cellulated T antigen. And this is the analysis iron mobilogram of the or the 366 ion, and you can see again better one four linkage of this because this bound is a, it's a, li a more liable. So this is the major ions. So in conclusion, 
using our low collision energy uh, glycopeptide fragmentation, we confirmed that eight glycosides out of 22, we ident identify several structure motifs, uh, the lactinac, sulfolactinac, polylactinac, or autoamphocosylated lactinac, as well as autoamphocosylated lactinac. And um, we identified one non occupied glycosides and one glycoside predominantly occupied by, by high monos and one glycoside by lactinac structure. In, in case of the uh, O glycosylation, we identified nine, nine occupied O glycoside, uh, which is eight more than previously reported, and uh, one of the glycosides is, is that well, the glycoside which is predicted near to the furin cleavage sites, the other two, they are non-occupied at least in our analysis. And using the eye mobility, we were able to, uh, we were able to see the, the core one and core two structures with the C, uh, linkage of the CL legacy to alpha 2.6 as well as alpha 2.3. Thank you. OK, thanks, Milo, for a great talk. Uh, lots of uh, interesting data there. Um, so quite a few questions have come in on the Slack channel. I'll uh, just try and work my way through them. Um, so um, one question is, um, how are you obtaining the material for the analyses that you show? Are you also expressing uh, in uh, Nine Three? The, yeah, exactly. Uh, no, we, we don't express it. We, we purchase the protein, but the protein is expressed or expressed in, in hex cells. So and are you finding the same thing as Rod, that you're finding a lot of batch to batch variability from the um, the recombinant protein that you're purchasing? Uh, we, we, we had two batches, batches and we, we saw the variability between the batches. Yeah. And um, same question that I think I already asked Rod, but what, what do you think of the biological significance is of the difference in the glycan structures that you're observing? Uh, I think. Uh, <laughs> This is a great question, but I, for example, when we when we studied the the PDL1 glycoprotein, we found the the significant differences in the in the the binding the the protein to the antibody and related to the glycan structure, especially the poly polylactic structure. So I think it's very significant. Um, and do you know how the spike protein is, in bind is binding endogenous proteins when its glycosylation profile seems to be so variable? Does it does it have much of an impact on the substrate recognition, e.g., um, for, for ACE2? Uh, there is literature that could could be related to the glycan. Yeah. And uh, someone's asked just which instrumentation you're using. I'm guessing from your schematic that it was a synapt, but you mentioned you also have a Timstoff. Have you done? Yeah, uh, analysis on both instruments. Uh, for for SARS uh, COVID glycoprotein, we use uh, mostly orbiter Lumos. Okay. Uh, for the PDL one, uh, we use the Timstof and uh, three triple uh, from Sykes as well as uh, orbiter. And then, um, are you going to study the effect of the O glycosylation near the furin cleavage site on uh, the virus's infectivity? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that uh, we want to move forward and, and basically study the impact of that O glycosides, O glycan on that, on that uh, furing, furing cleavage. Uh, it's just because we, we, what we saw is a 13% of site occupancy, which is not too much, but again, it's an is a overexpression system on the, on the real, uh, the viral. Uh, protein uh, could be totally different. Great. And then a uh, bit of a technical question. How long does it take for the cyclic eye mobility to actually do five passes? Oops, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I don't know why I need to ask uh, the okay, person enough. who. And did. then uh, another question. Do you see any uh, O-linked manoslation? No, I did. I did not see, but I, I, my analysis wasn't focused on on the old manuscripts. Yeah. 
Uh, and then um, I don't know if you've seen it, but there was a recent paper with some cryo electron uh, tomography data, um, obviously showing the high level of glycosylation on the spike protein. Um, is it possible to compare what you've seen with that kind of data? And would your data also agree with their observation that there's a higher prevalence of N glycosylation over the O-link? Mm, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's a uh... Yeah, maybe. Okay, Doug. Uh, I think that's it for all that's come in right now on the Slack channel that I can see. Um, so yeah, I'd just really like to um, thank both of our speakers uh, for today and everyone who uh, has joined us and our sponsors and those committee members who are working away in the background to make this webinar possible. As mentioned earlier, we will have a form for those requiring certificates of attendance, which will be accessible for about five minutes after we wrap up. And uh, yeah, don't forget to join us again in two weeks on the 4th of September for our next general proteomics webinar focusing on proteogenomics with speaker Professor Jana Letio from the Karolinski Institute and our guest chair, our previous presenter, uh, Professor Leonard Martins. So thanks everyone for your time today. Great talks and uh, we'll see you in two weeks.